Will it be the same old song and dance for the Buds this postseason, or can they get back in the series with a Game 2 victory? We'll get into it on today's edition of the Locked On Lease podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, the daily Maple Leaf Centric podcast, hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Well, winning or losing is only optional in Toronto because the uh, uh, loss, uh, loss in Game 1 is what uh, is what we had to suffer as a fan base there. And it's really unfortunate, Dave, because I thought the team actually came out with some gumption, came out with some uh, with some, some heat, and I thought they were pretty physical to start. They were all over the Boston Bruins, finishing every check possible. But as typically happens with the Buds, they make one little mistake, it comes back to bite them, and, uh, well, they end up losing the game. 5-1 was the final for Game 1. Bruins now up one to nothing in the best of seven. Uh, what did you make of the least performance the other night? Well, I, I was seeing all the memes. I was seeing all the pictures. I won the literally said, I'm ready to get hurt again. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, no matter how much, you put yourself in a position to be ready for whatever pain is coming. It still hurts. It still hurts. Yeah. That hurt. <laughs> that hurt, man. It did. And and I think it's just because like the lease did start out really well. I mean, I'm, I was watching it with, uh, with a good buddy of mine. I hadn't seen him in a while, but we both, you know, kind of bonded when we first, uh, it was an old roommate of mine. We used to bond by watching the Maple Leafs. So we we're like, Oh, let's get together for game one. And to the first, like, two minutes of the hockey game we were like hey buds are buzzing they're looking good like yeah mitch marner out there finishing checks matthew nice was finishing every check and then next thing you know ryan reeves goes to finish a check along with joel edmondson who decided to go and make an errant pinch and a two-on-one ensues and then boston on their first shot of the hockey game puts it into the back of the net and all of a sudden it's like why why all the momentum was with Toronto. They were trying to take the home crowd out of the building with a few good hard shifts. And then all of a sudden one, you know, one mistake and it cost them dearly. And I don't know what it is with Toronto, but it does seem like whenever that happens to them, whenever they like momentum gets stopped, it's hard for them to get it back. I don't even know what, what, what to call that. If that's like, I don't know, lack of mental fortitude or what it is. But it's almost as if uh, this happens to them all the time because the same thing happened in the second period, right? Uh, They came out pretty good to start the second as well, had a couple really good chances. Matthews should have scored to make it one one realistically, but instead goes down the ice and, you know, a few seconds later, it's 2 nothing, then 3, then 4, and, you know, the game really got out of hand at that point. Penalties really started to pile up and, you know, I, I think by the third period, the Leafs were thinking about, unfortunately, thinking about game two at that point. Um, but whatever reason it is, like they could be, you know, really gaining momentum, playing well, and then one mistake kind of kills the momentum, and then they're just unable to get it back. And I don't, I don't know why that is. Personally, if if I were to give my best chance of figuring it out, I say it's in between the ears. Yeah, yeah, that, that's me really how it felt. You look at the way that they were fumbling the like I was talking with the colleague this morning while we were like we had to go through we had to go through blow by blow of what happened and he coaches uh he coaches uh youth hockey and he said it just seemed like they were nervous after like after allowing the goals they just played so out of sync couldn't make passes properly you know they're trying to do the dump and chase but not it- I doing think a good job chasing. Yeah, it's almost as if they they allow the first goal and then like, okay, we can't allow the second goal. So instead of of attacking and playing loose and playing yep. their game, 
they get defensive and then they, they play like just not their style. And, um, you know, then it just became a little bit more of, of a, you know, Bruins style of game. And that's not what you wanted. You wanted it to be a little bit more fast paced. Now missing William Nylander obviously is a big factor there. He's a guy who brings a lot of pace to the hockey game. We do have an update ish on Nylander. We'll give it to you uh, a little bit later on, but how much of a factor do you think his absence played in how that game kind of turned out for the Leafs? Do you think it mattered a lot and he'll be able to make a big difference if he can get back into the lineup for game two? Or do you think like, I don't know, the the, the same old Leaf showed up and one guy shouldn't be able to make that much of a difference? Like, I don't think it's it was like uh, all this went awry because William Nylander wasn't in the lineup. Would he have made a difference? I think he would have made a difference because when we're talking about not playing with pace. He's, as you said, is one of the few guys on the team that actually plays with pace, yeah. can carry the puck, shoot the puck, right? Things like that. But at the same time, like you've got one player out out of a core. So we say the core four. There's other guys on there. Like I thought, okay, before I bury a lot of players, I felt like JT was one of those guys where he was putting the effort. He was getting through bodies. He was going and hunting down pucks. He was doing his best in those things. But at the same time, it means nothing if you're not getting the opportunities. And the Bruins were content, as I said, content with the guys not getting into the dangerous areas. Look at the only goal the Leafs scored. Where do they do? Got right into the into the slot. Mm -hmm. And it was the fourth line, right? Yeah. Kept it simple. Yeah. Knew exactly what they needed to do. And the Bruins, there were opportunities there. It's just the Leafs were, were I don't know, I, I felt like they were rushing things. They weren't being patient. Yeah. The Bruins were being very patient. Like, the Leafs weren't cycling the puck very well. They were trying maybe too hard to force things that weren't there. Shooting into a lot of blocks. Not allowing guys to get in front, to get in front of Swayman to create... You know, you know, hurt, you know, affect his eyesight. They got to be more patient. And that might be tough when you're down early. And I get that. But you're down one nothing. You have a whole hockey game in front of you. And you almost scored a one nothing, you know, a chance to get it yourself one one. And that was also because Austin Matthews waited for a play to develop, found an opening, got past the D man who made a bad decision and a team that made a bad decision, and then it was a matter of inches. This close. So close. So close. That post. That I don't know what it was about that one net because it <laughs> wasn't just the Leafs hitting posts. It was the Bruins hitting posts on that one yeah. side. Did you, see that, about that net. did you see that one stat about, uh, I think it's like current NHLers, active NHLers, like how many posts and crossbars that they've hit in the playoffs. And Matthews, I think, was second on the list with 12. Um, tied. I think Pasternak was tied with him or something. But in, like, 30 less games. <laughs> like, he's got 12 posts in, like, uh, what it was, 25 games or something like that in the playoffs. Uh, it, it's, it's wild how unlucky this guy gets come postseason time. And, uh, again, you know, Saturday night, unable to, to score on basically a wide-open cage. Um, but just just hits it off the post. Couldn't do what uh, what Adam Lowry did. Just wasn't able to do that, you know. Yeah, Al Lowry can hit the post three times and score. Some real skill to do that. Apparently, that was insane. Uh, for anyone who missed that uh, goal, go check that out. Uh, it just completely disregarded physics for uh, for a quick moment and somehow mm -hmm. crossed over the line. It really, it's, it's hard to talk about. You just got to go and look, look look for it yeah. for yourself. Go look up the Adam Lauer goal from uh, that insane wild uh, Jets and Colorado Avalanche game. Uh, but you know what? Like, it, it's so tough to, you know, to knock the Leafs too hard. Like, I, I, it's not that they played bad. It's just, ultimately, the Leafs, they leafed the game up, right? They, a couple of bad uh, decisions and a couple of bad turnovers cost them and special teams cost them at the end of the day, that, that, it, that was the difference in this hockey game was special teams. And we talked about it coming into the game, how that was going to be a big time decider, potentially good or bad. Um, if, 
if uh, if the Leafs couldn't figure out how to kill off penalties because they haven't been able to do that recently. And they allowed two power play goals. That gave Boston the opportunity to blow the game open um, and take you know the real stranglehold in the game. And 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 it was like really careless, ticky tacky. I'll call them careless penalties, and then just flat out dumb penalties like the slashing uh, that Max Domi took that Sheldon Keefe did not like. It, if it, it, he told the media about five times that Domi's penalty was dumb and and that can't happen. Just imagine what he actually said to Domi. Like, I guarantee you he gave him a tongue lashing uh, at some point. But, like, how how many times is that the issue for Toronto? Undisciplined play, poor penalty kill, couple of mistakes, they lose the game. It reminds me a lot about the game in right. the regular season in Boston, right? You know, McKay in their, in their own zone, you know, takes a stupid penalty. Bruins get the power play. They score a goal. Bruins know that they they don't need to do much, right? They don't have to go. They're not going to outskill the Leafs. We know that. What they're going to do is get themselves in the best opportunities to do the simple things. The the one thing I like you, you did mention, like five on five, we know the Leafs outchance the Bruins and things like that. Do you know but what we're, the reserve to winometer was? At yeah, I I saw that, and I just want to burn that page down to the ground. Like I I it's it's so it it's so infuriating to see that page after a Leafs playoff loss. Oh, I know, because it always it always is that way. So for those who didn't see it, um, moneypuck.com does a deserve to winometer, uh, and basically they do a bunch of simulations based on all of the analytics that are provided. Um, and they basically play out, okay, if they were to play a 1,000 games with this many scoring chances, this many high danger chances, this many this, this and many that, how many games would they win out of a 1,000? And apparently the Maple Leafs uh, should win about 80% of those hockey games, 800 out of a 1,000 games if they were to play it the exact same way a 1,000 times. This was one of the 20% obviously where the Boston Bruins were uh, able to win. But the difference, the difference, Dave, of course, is special teams. And that clearly uh, not only on, on, on the stat sheet and the scoreboard, but also like the underlying numbers show that the Leafs should have won, but then you factor that in, they allowed two goals on the power play. And that was the difference. So uh, really unfortunate uh, for the Leafs to drop game one. I know that, you know, Leaf fans uh, are, are a tortured bunch, and it really means that it's 48 hours of a lot of angst leading into Game 2. We'll preview Game 2 in a little bit, but why don't we come back and get to the good, the bad, the ugly from Game 1, then we can kind of close the book on that, and we can get an update on William Nylander. Will he be available in Game 2? There's some slight, slight clarity on it. But coming up next, we'll tell you all the details you need to know for our Austin Matthews jersey giveaway. So don't leave us. We'll tell you how to win yourself a jersey on the other side. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. You're listening to the Lockdown Leafs podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel's your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers. Customers bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on the app that's safe, secure, and easy to lose. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Today's show is also brought to you by Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies. And their team of licensed experts is on hand to help you talk through it. Your work-life 
life insurance policy uh, may not offer enough protection for your family's needs. And even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. Policy Genius gives you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team. They have no incentive to recommend one insurer over the other, so you could trust their guidance. Check life insurance off your to do list with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on NHL or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Locked on NHL. Welcome back into the Locked On At Least podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti with you. We are your hosts here at Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast. We got shows coming out each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. And with the playoffs here, you're not going to want to miss a show, not going to want to miss a minute. So make sure that you're subscribed to us uh, on whichever platform you use to stream your podcast audio wise and also, of course, up on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, we hit 5,000 subscribers last week, which means we are giving away. And Austin Matthews jersey. So uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the Locked On Leafs podcast on YouTube. If you are, then you qualify for the jersey. Uh, we have a link in the show notes below. So make sure that you go there. There'll be a form for you to fill out with some basic content information. And uh, that's basically how you actually enter in. So you subscribe. Make sure you're a subscriber. And then fill out the form. And then you'll be entered into the... Uh, you'll be entered into the contest giveaway. And from there, we'll be randomly selecting one lucky winner from all of the applicants. And we'll probably allow like a week or so for people to, uh, to um, go to the website and, and put their application in, fill out the form uh, just in case, you know, people aren't listening to this specific podcast or maybe miss a couple just to give everybody all 5,000 subscribers an opportunity to, uh, to, to win themselves the Jersey. Um, any other, uh, information about that, that the people should know, Dave? Yeah. I mean, just, uh, again, make sure you're subscribed, uh, on top of that, please make sure you're using, you're giving us all the information. Cause once yeah. we get like, don't use a pseudo name cause we're going to have to make sure you have the proper contact and make sure you're actual person as yeah. well. Cause we need to get in touch with you to send you the jerseys. So yes. <laughs> I don't want to hear from, you know. Uh, Willie Styles 69 or Big Poppy 69, which actually I did see somebody with a Poppy jersey the other day with a 69 on the back. I thought was kind of funny. Um, but anyways, besides the point, uh, we need your actual name <laughs> yeah. in order to make you uh, eligible to, to win this. So again, down the show notes, there'll be a link down there. Click the link and then fill out the the form and give us the uh, the contact information and uh, about like when round one ends we will close the submission form and then we will randomly select uh, one lucky subscriber to win the Matthews jersey. All right, let's get to the good, the bad, the ugly, Dave. As we do here uh, after every single loss, whether it's the regular season or the playoffs, we still got to go through it. Um, let's start with some of the good, right? Like we, we, like we talked about the Leafs technically at five on five, won 80% of the minutes, or we're supposed to win that game 80% of the time. Uh, they didn't obviously, but there were some good, right? I, there were some good. I, I, I like the start of the, the, the first period. I loved the start. The first two and a half minutes I thought were excellent, right? Just the way that they were going out there, playing with pace. They were finishing every check. They had a couple of real good opportunities early. They were going through all four lines quickly. Um, and then, obviously, we saw the the first goal kind of kind of happen. Uh, but up until that moment, I thought they were playing stellar, stellar hockey. And if they can just replicate that for an entire game almost, I think that they'll be in a really good spot. Um, but I also want to give a special shout out to the fourth line. Like I thought, that, again, the fourth line actually played well. They scored the only goal for the Maple Leafs. Uh, and if you look at the underlying numbers, they were the best line for Toronto. By the way, the goal that they scored was against Tampa's top line, which I think is notable. Boston's top line. Sorry, sorry. Boston's top line, which is notable. Um, but yeah. also, um, yeah, they were just consistently, again, uh, winning battles in the offensive zone and just kind of wearing down, you know, the Bruins in the O zone. I think they only allowed like one scoring chance against it happened to be the goal to uh, to open the scoring. But outside of that, they were pretty good. Uh, so I, I think 
you know, the fourth line, we'd, we'd liked what we had seen in the recent weeks, and they parlayed it into a good uh, first game for themselves in the playoffs. So that, that, that was a good sign, I would say. What else did you like, Dave? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the you, you talked about the fourth line. I thought they were good. Um, I liked the way that they came out in the third period. I thought, you know, yes, was it too little too late? Probably. But again, they showed areas of where they can expose the Bruins for more chances. They just got to bury on those chances a little bit more. I I know the game sheet maybe didn't show properly, but I thought Timothy Logren made some really nice plays. Like that guy had to stop David Pasternak a few times coming down the barrel, and he went stride for stride with David Pasternak. That to me was impressive. I was most concerned about Timothy Lilligren going into this series, and that I mean, yes, it's one game. I'm not going to say that he's got it, but it's a good start. He's starting on the right foot for me. So, did he earn another game? Because there is a player on the outside looking in that I'm sure would love to get into a game, TJ Brody. Did Timothy Lilligren do enough to kind of stave off a lineup change there, in your opinion? In my opinion, yes. Um, the thing is, is, like, yeah, if you're bringing TJ Brody, who's coming out, like, there's not many options when you're looking at who uh, is it's coming Lilligren. out. It's got to be Lilligren. But yeah, I think I if Sh- right. Sheldon Keefe will likely take a Lilligren, yeah. If I, it, to me, it's either Lilligren or Labushkin. I, I didn't. I thought Labushkin actually had a pretty good game. I I, I liked kind of Labushkin's play. Uh, I thought that he was kind of physical as well. I mean, I know he's on the ice for for a goal, um, but I didn't mind. I I don't think unless I don't think there's going to be many lineup changes between game one and two. Hopefully, Nylander. Uh, again, we'll have an update there in a moment uh, when we finish up the good, the bad, the ugly. But outside of that, I'm not sure. Uh, even though, transitioning into the bad, uh, Ilya Samsonov did not have a good game. Uh, you know, I thought a couple of those goals were, were pretty soft. Obviously, there's a couple that, it, what are you going to do, right? Two on one, those are tough to stop. But it kind of went through him, like right through him. I thought the Carlo shot too uh, kind of went, right through him like I, there's a couple of goals that I just didn't really like and I don't believe that he played bad enough and poor enough like it wasn't Georgiev level bad where I'm like uh, this guy cannot be between the pipes for game two so I don't think he's lost the net just yet but he does need to have a big bounce back game in order to keep it because trust me if, if it's another four goal outing four or five goal outing on Samsonov Bulls coming in for game three so, although he was terrible, uh, he was, you know, there was a couple of bad goals, I would say. Um, I think he still probably gets another game, though. For me, like, yeah, it wasn't to the point where I'm like, they lost this game because of Samsonov. Look, this wasn't an Alexander Georgiev allowing seven goals when your team scores six. Samsonov's margin for error was literally, we're only scoring one goal. Two. Two, two at most market for error right like i will have i will make the case to switch out samsonov when this team scores four or five goals and he allows six like he was earlier in the season so mm-hmm. for me that's where does he need to play better absolutely i thought there was goals that he wasn't really tracking the puck he was late to react not doing a great job fighting through the screens which brings me to my bad which is learn how to clear guys in front of the net you are bringing physical play to this series. It means diddly squat when you hit a guy against the boards and not do anything about the guys who are literally screening your goalie and get and allowing the Bruins to get quality scoring chances because your goalie can't see the puck. Yeah, no, completely, completely agree. Those net front battles uh, definitely need need some work. They got to do better. That's a big reason why you went out and got a guy like Labushkin and why you and went Edmonton. out and you, you got yourself Joel Edmondson and, and, or yeah, I meant to say Edmondson actually instead of Labushkin, but I guess they're both in the same boat and why Joel, uh, Simone Benoit is in the lineup over TJ Brody. That's supposed to be, you know, stuff that they, they do better and what is supposed to happen in these games, which is why Brody is not in the lineup. Um, but yeah, so that that certainly will need to improve going into the game too. Uh, ugly. I mean, I know what I think was was ugly. I, I would love to hear you go first, though. Oh, it's the power play. Oh, I 
special teams. I thought special yeah. teams in general. I, I, the power, the Pelling kill was brutal, but to me, it doesn't even come close to how bad I thought the power play was. Because as bad as the Pelling kill was, the power play had opportunities. Yeah. You get a four on three with both Lindholm and McAvoy in the box. And yeah. I thought that was putrid what I saw. It was Tavares. It was Marner. It it's was Matthews. Perfect. And it was Bradley. Dude, I don't understand. Like, it, it, nothing makes me more angry when I'm watching this power play than when they're s- stagnant. And, like, yeah. that's, like, it, it happens so often. When this power play is struggling, it's when it's stagnant. When the power play is flourishing, it's so fluid. They're all skating around. They're zipping the puck around. They're they're changing spots. They're rotating each other. Like, Matthews is weaving in and out of traffic. Like, that is when this power play is always at its best. There are lots of cross-ice. They get the players moving, open up space, get the goalie moving, and they end up with a nice little cross-ice feed or maybe you get a, 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 a shot through a screen, a Tavares screen or something. But that's not what we saw. Like, this, this, this power play legitimately it's as if they were all just standing in one little spot you had you had uh matthews in his little corner you had marner in his little corner you had net front presence and then you had uh riley up at the top and they're just kind of going you know as if it's a diamond right one guy back to riley back over here back up top back to like it's to, to, to the wall tries to cross over oh it gets kicked or it gets hit out of the air and it's sent down the ice and now they got to regroup again it's it was so pathetic and it, i just can't stand when that power play is so heavy footed and they just aren't moving around there and it's always always a killer for them um and especially in the playoffs like when you got a team that is going to be suffocating on the penalty kill like the boston bruins you can't just stand there like that's why you can't get shots off and that's why you're shooting into people's legs and into their shins because you're making it easy for them. You're just standing there. <laughs> it's it's outrageous, man. I'm I'm with you. The the power play was disgusting, but giving up a couple of uh penalty kill, a couple of goals on was just as uh, egregious. I mean, we knew that the special teams is going to play a factor into the series, and it was the difference in game one. Um, we should probably mention the fact that the Leafs were the far more undisciplined team as well, which you can't can't have that. Like a couple of really uh errant sticks like just you know sloppy penalties the high sticking from bertuzzi a high stick from matthews it's like just keep your stick on the ice keep your stick on the ground what are you raising your stick at head level for only bad things can happen when you have your stick head level right it's Mm -hmm. it's really uh yeah just i don't know it was was, uh (sighs) frustrating like that part of the game was frustrating for sure and uh, i think domi slash also it's like play within the game right play within the game so those parts to me were were ugly the the penalties that were penalties like we're not going to sit here and say the refs were you know only hammering the leafs like those are penalties those are going to get called every single time make sure you don't have your stick in someone's face right don't slash a guy's wrist off the face off for nothing (laughs) like don't do that those are going to get called uh so just some very undisciplined play and when your pk is as bad as it is cannot afford it cannot afford it it's non-negotiable they got to be far more disciplined uh going into game two and that power play they got to start moving their feet because it it was it was just ugly and i know there was no nylander who is a big part of that power play Mm -hmm. but still uh unacceptable how they were playing there. Can I also make one final point on the power play? Yes. Sir. If we Nylander is not going to play in game two, please, for the love of mercy, put Nick Robertson on that top unit and take Yali on Croak off. You yeah. need someone who's going to shoot the puck. Yeah. Cause if it's just awesome, Matthew shooting the puck, the Bruins are going to do what they did in this game, which was make sure Austin Matthews is looked after on that one side. And, also, Mitch Marner, if you're going to be a distributor on the power play, distribute the puck. Don't hold it for like 10 seconds before making a decision on where you're going to go with the puck. Move it, That's get what... some pace going. But the problem is everyone was standing still. So it's yeah. like, where am I going to move it to? It's like, can you get open? Can you move your feet? You know, yeah. get get away That's from true. traffic. Like that that was a big problem with uh yeah, everyone was just standing still, which you cannot do on a power play. The best power plays are one that are, are fast. 
Um, Look at the Bruins power play. They were moving around. The Leafs were not able to get set. Guys yeah. were were getting in, in screening. Down in, low, in front up of high, field. into the middle, cross ice, like all of it. Get the puck moving all around the ice. Uh, you got more guys out there. Utilize them, right? Don't just utilize the two people, right? You can't just go Riley to Matthews, Riley to Matthews, back over to Marner, back to Riley to Matthews. Like that. Ugh. Anyways, uh, enough with the, the power play. Let's take a break. Let's come back and let's kind of turn the page and look forward to game two. Uh, we've kind of been doing that a little bit here, but uh, we'll give an update on William Nylander, whether or not he will be available for the Maple Leafs and some other updates and uh, maybe the key, the key difference that we think the, the, the Maple Leafs will need to get themselves back in the series and tie things up uh, in game two tonight. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morris Studio. You're listening to the Lockdown Leafs podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now the authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, where uh, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Price on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from receipt, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. You can pick out uh, last minute zone deals. You can save up to sixty percent off buying last minute tickets for sports, comedy events. Uh, concerts, theaters, whatever. They've got flash deals. You can save even more money with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game. Uh, they've got all-in pricing. They've got zone deals, seat views, and the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guest time. Out, get, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app. Last ticket, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back into the Locked On At Least podcast. Mike DiStefano and Dave Morasuti. Back to uh, another game tonight. Back to the Garden. The Leafs go for game two of this best of series. Down uh, one up, obviously, after losing game uh, game number one. Uh, um, game two is important because <laughs> the Leafs will be in big trouble if they go back to Toronto and they're down 0-2. And uh, the way that this team has folded in the past, I I would not want to. Uh, I'm sure my most Leafs look tonight as a must win for this because at that point it's it really becomes all right the Leafs got to win four to five at, at this point um and that's that becomes so difficult to do so so difficult to do especially against a team like this uh what do you think is the number one thing that the Leafs are going to have to do tonight to make sure that they cement themselves uh, with the victory and tie this thing up into Toronto. Well, I mean, apparently the start's going to be important. You cannot allow that back-breaking first goal. Make the Bruins work for it, right? You got to, I think, you look at that game, they were getting themselves into the high danger areas, but you got to be patient. You got to be disciplined. Don't go and pinch when you don't need to. Don't take it, make a hit that might be unnecessary. Worrying about playing the puck and not the man, I think that's going to be crucial because that's what got them in trouble yeah. at the start there. Yeah, I think uh, Tyler Bertuzzi said it best uh, today after practice. He basically came out and said, hey, we, we got to stick to our game. And we can't – they came out with energy, but they were a little overzealous when it came to the physicality. They can't do that. They can't go away from their game and all of a sudden try and play like they're the Broad Street Bullies. Like there's one thing – you know, setting a tone is one thing and playing physical is one thing, but being over aggressive is, is another. And that's, you know, what cost them in that first goal. So 100%, uh, I, I agree with you. There's a fine line and they definitely are going to have to, to, to find it and tow it tonight. Um, obviously we spoke a lot about special teams that has to be better, uh, better tonight. But I think the breakouts too need to be, uh, need to be better. I think that potentially if Willie can come back into this game, you know, he's someone who could drive play through the middle of the ice. Um, and I think that would help. So uh, yeah, like there's a couple of things that I think Toronto needs to do, but like it was a pretty solid performance uh, again, 80% of the time they should have won that game. Uh, but if they could just remain disciplined, 
not take too many penalties, uh, if they can convert on the power play uh, and and toe that line between playing physical and and you know being disciplined while doing so, I think they'll be in good shape tonight and and just get an, an extra save or two from Samsonov. I think that's what you're going to need as well, an extra save or two and just a couple of the things to go your way. Uh, one of which, hopefully is the return of William Nylander. Uh, it was really weird, the whole Nylander situation. I, I fully in- expected to see him on the ice. I know he didn't practice Friday, but I expected to see him there uh, in game in game one, but was not, obviously, and, and that was a big story. Uh, according to Chris Johnston from TSN and The Athletic, uh, he wrote a story about this uh, with a semi-update on Nylander. Uh, per sources... Uh, CJ sources. Uh, apparently, Nylander woke up stiff on Thursday morning, just randomly, and uh, just didn't feel right and was unable to go. Whatever that means. It was kind of vague reporting, but he woke up stiff Thursday and was unable to go. So it wasn't anything that he tweaked. He wasn't playing with an injury down the stretch. This was something new that he just woke up with. Is Is... What's being reported? Uh, very, very weird situation there, Dave. Yeah, and and it led to, to this is where the whole and you and I talked about this when Keith came out and said, "Oh, Brad Trilliving's telling me not to give you up to date injuries, not to go too yeah. in depth." What it does, at least, to stupid speculation, mm-hmm. and again. I don't blame the people that were speculating that potentially this was disciplinary and I, and, and things like that. Like, do I believe it? No, because a coach would be, that'd be a pretty dumb thing to bench a player like Nylander oh, for a disciplinary God, no. thing. Okay. Who thought it was, so like, someone thought it was a benching. There were some people who had messaged, messaged me and said, is this, could this have been disciplinary? And I said, that would be pretty dumb Wait, to do. Bill Belichick or something? <laughs> yeah, no. This like if at worst, what you could do is maybe not play the guy in the first five minutes or something like that. Like I've seen coaches do that instead of full out benching guys. But it wasn't even in practice. It's not as though Yeah. Yeah. To anyway. me, to me, this is and, and again, people and what I hated was people say, Brat no, Patrice Bergeron played with a punctured lung and uh, I think it was like a, they were with collapsed lung or something like that and, and a, some fractured ribs. Patrice Bergeron probably should not have done that, right? Like, I don't need William Nylander to play through something that's not going to make him the William Nylander that he needs to be. Like, I, like let's stop with that whole mentality that Nylander, oh, one little thing and I'm not playing. Like, Nylander's been the most durable player on this team for years. If something's not right with him, it likely means it, it wasn't good enough for him to play. Like yeah. the insiders, as good as they are, they're not getting the full information of what exactly is wrong, where the discomfort was. So we can only speculate. And that's again, a problem, right? We're not the Vegas golden Knights who have to now disclose every single injury because of their history. But yeah, the, I don't need a full doc support on Nylander, but I also just hate the way that they're going about this because now you're getting yeah, this whole just, weird thing going say, on. Say, uh, you know, ankle injury, knee injury, wrist injury, like just give me something, but uh, we're not going to get that. And even give me have upper body or lower body at this rate. Like, I don't care. I don't yeah. need it to be. Just give me something other than nothing. No, not no change. Nothing. Not going to no. like really. Yeah, and, and even like the the woke up stiff Thursday was like a a, a background source that wasn't even anyone willing to go yeah. on the record. It's just a background source. <laughs> oh, so. if someone went on the record with that, given what your living's new directive is, oh boy, yeah, yeah. oh tree might be looking for a leak. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Keith said no update though, of course, in practice, which we knew there was not going to be updates anyways. But the reporters. Still got to ask, you know, maybe Keith you forgot. Do. Maybe Keith for, will forget the directive and maybe he'll let it slip what's going on. But uh, did not, did not. But you mentioned it like durability just quickly. This is just the second game, the second game in Willie's 653 game career that he's ever missed. So 
yeah, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, benefit of the doubt that he couldn't play because he's played virtually every single game that he's ever played. And he's a guy who wakes up for playoffs and he is a gamer. So um, typically somewhat kind of, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think to suggest that he could have played or should have played or the I did not hear the uh benching one that that was new to me i do not think that is at all what what happened here uh hopefully he's good to go the good thing is he was at practice on monday uh or on sunday and he lasted the entire practice i believe he was the first guy out on the ice uh well maybe- it was like an optional skate with the yeah, extra optional skate. yeah optional but he was skate. on the ice We've, we have now confirmed that William the yeah. is alive, at least. Yes, he was on the ice and apparently stayed the longest. So I think I, I read in, in CJ's story he was on the ice mm-hmm. for 56 minutes. So I don't know if someone had a stopwatch out there or what. But, uh, yeah, he was on the ice for 56 minutes today. So perhaps getting uh, getting himself revved up to enter the postseason tomorrow, uh, tonight, rather, for, uh, for game two of the playoffs because they're going to need him going to need him for sure because again Leeds cannot afford to go down 0-2 back to Toronto this is uh as as mandatory win as it gets man um gotta gotta try and get the the dub I know they say teams never out of it until they lose on home ice but the way that this Leafs team has been quite fragile upstairs over the course of their careers I do not want to see what a what a Leafs down 0-2 looks like. Actually, I did. I did. It was last year in Florida, and they played their worst game of the ever, ever in that uh, in that game against the the Panthers. I was there. No, I was in Florida. It was brutal. Uh, yeah, gross, gross. Can't let that happen uh, happen again. All right. Final reminder, by the way, uh, to fill out that giveaway form. It'll be in the show notes down below. All right. Do they win, though? Do they win? Do they win? Do they win? Do they win? No, I don't know. All right, let's wrap things up, Dave. It's getting late. That'll do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morisuti. Uh, we'll be back for another episode for you guys tomorrow. Enjoy the game tonight. Go, Leafs, go. Keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.